You can access uh, those whenever you'd like. We're in the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 6, and I'd like to ask us to read this morning verses 7 through 15. Matthew chapter 6, please follow along as I read, verses 7 through 15. Jesus, speaking, says this, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Let's pray once more together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that you have revealed yourself in these last days through your own dear Son. We thank you for all the ways he has taught us most of all, and how He saved us through His work on the cross. We are coming this morning to a crucial section of teaching from our Lord. We pray that You would make us all to be eager disciples, to hear from our Master, to follow His will, to pray, to learn to pray as He has taught us to, and to forgive those who sin against us as we ourselves hope to be forgiven. Please, Lord, come now by your Spirit and be our teacher. Disciple us all now through your Word and through preaching. We pray together in Jesus' name, amen. On June 17, 2015, a 21-year-old young man named Dylan Roof entered a Bible study at Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston, South Carolina, one of the nation's oldest historic black churches. After sitting for over an hour with the small assembly of Christians gathered for prayer and the study of God's Word, Roof unloaded fire, killing nine and injuring one. Five people survived the massacre. Roof later made clear his crimes were racially motivated, and he stated that he hoped by his actions to start a race war. He further stated, quote, I would like to make it crystal clear that I do not regret what I did. I am not sorry. I have not shed a tear for the innocent people I killed." Two days after the event, there was a televised bond hearing for Roof. At the time of the hearing, not even 48 hours had passed since the killings. After, or excuse me, at the hearing, the judge permitted members of the families of the victims to speak directly to Dylan Roof and to say anything to him that they wished to say. And the first to speak to him was Nadine Collier, the daughter of one of the victims, Ethel Lance. Collier's statement was short and it was uttered through tears. She said to Ruth, quote, I just want everybody to know, I forgive you. You took something very precious away from me. I will never talk to her ever again. I will never be able to hold her ever again, but I forgive you, and I have mercy for your soul. You've hurt me. You've hurt a lot of people, but may God forgive you, and I forgive you. And one after another, families of the victims spoke to Ruth and offered essentially the same message. It was a message of forgiveness. Polly Shepard was one of the five survivors of the Charleston church shooting. After holding a gun to her head, Ruth had told her, I'm leaving you alive to tell the story. In the aftermath of the shooting, Shepard also emphasized again and again that she forgave Ruth fully and freely. 
She was later interviewed on the Today Show and asked how it was that she could forgive him. She said, it tells us in Matthew 6, after the Lord's Prayer, you have to forgive others that you may be forgiven. Today we return to our series in Matthew's Gospel. We've been in the Sermon on the Mount for a few months now. We come this morning to the third and final sermon on the Lord's Prayer. Uh, In the first sermon two weeks ago, uh, I first sought to ask and answer the question, what do we have in the Lord's Prayer? And we saw that we have in the Lord's Prayer revelation from the Lord Himself. We have a guide to believing prayer, and we have teaching, focused teaching on prayer. And then we ask the question in that same message, what is meant by that designation, God, our Father who is in heaven? And we saw all that it's meant to communicate at the level of love and affection and tenderness and closeness, of freedom and open access to God through Jesus Christ, and of great power and authority. He is our Father in heaven. And that is to inform our thinking as we approach God in prayer, how we're to relate to Him in prayer. And then last week, we considered the first three petitions that were given in the Lord's Prayer, petitions that variously consider and take into view God's glory. We pray, hallowed be your name. A God's kingdom, we pray, your kingdom come. Uh, And God's will, we pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. This morning, my aim is to consider with you the final three petitions of the prayer. So we're going to consider under three headings this morning. First, the consideration of our daily needs. Number two, the forgiveness of our sins. And number three, our deliverance from temptation and evil. Let's consider first together our daily needs. We pray, verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Uh, This petition is perhaps the easiest of all the petitions to understand as its meaning is immediately manifest. Uh, It also may be the petition that's prayed most often. Uh, In this petition, simply put, we are asking God to provide for our daily needs. Now, one thing we need to appreciate as a matter of context when we come to the Lord's Prayer in this particular petition, as it's situated here in the prayer itself, is that the issue of the supply of daily bread was a matter of great anxiety to the people of Jesus' day. In the world of the Bible, think in terms of agrarian societies, the provision of daily bread was a matter of life and death. Uh, Kids, in Jesus' day, you wouldn't have had grocery stores, you know, well-stocked, loads and loads of bread, regularly restocked. It wasn't that way. Uh, You would have had famines in the land, and if there was a famine, it was a life and death situation. You might remember uh, when Jacob and his family uh, are in a situation of famine. Uh, how they have to flee to Egypt for rescue because it means imminent starvation for their family. This is a matter of daily anxiety for the people of Jesus' day. And you'll note in the petition, the prayer is for our daily bread. Again, I think some context is helpful here. We may think in our own context of extreme affluence in the United States of America. I hope you recognize we live presently in the richest society in human history. Uh, We live in greater decadence and affluence than most kings and queens throughout history. Uh, So, in the prayer itself, though, we're to pray for our daily bread. We, in our context today in America, may think in terms of annual salaries. Our taxes are assessed annually. We have benefits and insurance and things like that. And we have a phrase, if we say a family is living month to month, that indicates maybe it's it's difficult for them to make ends meet. They might even be in a desperate situation if they have to live month to month. Well, there was no year by year or month to month in the world in Jesus' day. You lived day to day. Uh, You were usually paid not annually, not monthly, not weekly. You were paid in daily wages, and sometimes those wages were paid in food, in actual bread. What I want us to appreciate is that daily provision, daily bread, was a matter of imminent anxiety for the audience to whom Jesus is speaking. We may not feel it's a matter of anxiety for us today, but it was a matter of anxiety for Jesus' audience then. Uh, Well, We as Christians have our own daily anxieties in our own context today related to life and provision and such things, and we're told that we should not be anxious for our daily provision. We're going to consider God willing in a few weeks, a little bit later on in this chapter, verses 25 through 34, where Jesus tells us to be anxious for nothing, not to worry, but to trust in God's fatherly provision. Well, that material that we'll consider in a few weeks should be read through this prayer and this petition we're given. Well, that's all important context we need to appreciate here to this petition. What then does the petition, give us this day our daily bread, reveal about ourselves 
and about God and about how we should address Him in prayer. There are at least three things I want us to see very briefly. First of all, this petition reveals to us that our Father in heaven is interested in the details of the lives of His children. Our Father in heaven is interested in the details of the lives of His children. You might think, what is bread to God? After all, what is, what is bread to God? Well, it's what His children need. And therefore, it matters to Him. Because it matters to us, His children, it matters thus to God. He cares about the details of the lives of His children. And so, friends, I say, if I cannot commit my daily bread to God, excuse me, if I can commit my daily bread to God, there's nothing I can't commit to God. If He cares about the loaf of bread on my table, well, there's nothing in my life that I can't bring to His attention and bring to Him in prayer. I just notice for a moment how much ground we've scaled just between the last three petitions and this one. We've gone from the concerns of God's glory and the hallowing of His name throughout the world and the advance and the imminent return of His kingdom which will stretch from sea to sea and His will that should be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, to something as seemingly as mundane as our daily bread. God is interested not only in these great concerns of His glory manifest across the globe and across eternity, but in the very details of our lives. Uh, We are accustomed maybe to people in high office or high rank or high authority uh, not caring uh, much at all about the needs of people below them. In fact, we set up corporate hierarchies and structures and political hierarchies and structures to sort of insulate the people on top from the details and concerns of the people on the bottom. Some of you are in corporate settings like this. You have buffers down the line that make sure if there's some like mundane little need there at the bottom, there's other people it could go to. You won't have to be bothered by the need. And that's maybe a good way to run a corporation. It's not the way God runs the universe. It's not the way he treats his family. God is intimately interested in the details of your life. So last week, I was trying to encourage us to expand the program of our prayers. Not just to bring the laundry list to God of our wants and our needs and our anxieties, but to recognize also we're to pray, we're to bring to God prayers that are as deep and as wide and as broad as God's heart himself. We're to pray for his glory throughout the world and throughout the nations. We're to pray for the concerns of his kingdom, the spread of the gospel. We're to pray concerning Christ's return. We're to pray that his will would be accomplished in the public sphere and all over the world, on earth as it is in heaven. But friends, this petition teaches us that we shouldn't forget the laundry list. We shouldn't leave it behind. God wants us to pray about the concerns of his glory throughout the world, and he would love to hear our prayers concerning the check engine light or the exam that's coming up or the matter of daily provision, or the hospital bill that's sitting there that you're afraid to open up. We are meant to bring these very things to our Father in prayer. He doesn't want to be insulated from those anxieties that are in your mind right now, those reminders on your phone, those lists at home, those things that keep you up at night. He says, no, bring those to me. Uh, As your Father, I want to take upon myself the needs of my children. So brothers and sisters, I just encourage you as a point of application. You must never think that anything is too small to bring to God in prayer. It doesn't honor God uh, to have the thought, well, I won't bother him with this. Uh, You know, this would be irreverent or inappropriate somehow for me to pray for so small a thing. No, even the matter of our daily provision, our daily bread, he wants us to bring to him, to rely on him in prayer for these very things. Uh, Parents in the room, fathers, mothers, you know this, right? Uh, You don't want your kids to be far off from you. You want them to communicate to you. What's going wrong? Are you all right? How can I help you? What can I do for you? If they have anxieties and needs, you want to hear those things. What parent would want to turn away their child? Well, that's the picture that should maybe be in our minds here. God wants to hear such things from his own children, and he is interested in the details of our lives. A second idea here in this first petition is that this petition reminds us that we depend at all times on God's fatherly care and provision. We depend at all times on God's fatherly care and provision. So easy to forget it in our climate and our culture today. 
But this is the reality, friends. There is no department in my life that does not need the constant care and blessing and superintendence of my Father God. In every department, I depend on Him. I have no merit, standing, stability, self-sufficiency, or strength in myself. My heart beats even now at God's command. I continue to breathe in and breathe out because God gives me oxygen and God sustains healthy lung activity to make it so. If I do not die today on my way home, it will be because God in His good providence and in His fatherly oversight and care is superintending traffic patterns and people's behavior last night who could be out on the road this afternoon to make sure that I'm alive and that I still live. How foolish we are to go through life inattentive and unthankful for the 10,000 different kindnesses that attend us every day. You think you're just going through life doing you, and yet every moment your life is kept from becoming a living hell because God, your Father, is caring for you. He's blessing you. He's looking after you. And this may be especially important for those of us here in the room uh, who are kind of the high achievers among us, maybe the, the smartest, the brightest, uh, those who have achieved the most, those who are you know, greatest in terms of their capacity and their ability. Uh, don't think for a second that the little kingdom you've built is being held up by your strength. Uh, the only reason uh, you did not drop dead this morning, the only reason all your assets are still in place, your house isn't burned down, your family's still intact, all these sorts of things, is because God has been remarkably kind to you. This petition should humble us. We depend at all times for everything, our daily bread and everything else besides, on the superintendence and care of our Father in heaven. The third thing I'd have us notice from this first petition, this petition calls us to childlike trust in God. It calls us to childlike trust in God. Uh, my children, have three children at home, they never worry about food and its provision and where it's going to come from. Of course, little do they know something could happen tomorrow that completely jeopardizes the standing of our family. And they don't know how vulnerable their dad is and how vulnerable the world is. Well, our Father in heaven is not vulnerable, and He's not in any kind of jeopardy. He is capable of caring for His children. And even as many of our own children don't have any anxiety about where the food's going to come from, with imperfect fathers, how should we have anxiety over having our daily needs met and our spiritual needs met? and material things done for us if our perfect Father in heaven is in perfect control and will never err and never stray. Our Father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He's not short on resources. More than that, He has made effectual promises to give me all that I need. He who did not spare His own Son will freely give me all things. He will work all things together for my good. And my Father who is in heaven is powerful to do it. And so, friends, we need not fear, but should humbly trust, and we should pray every day, Father in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. Provide for our basic needs. And like children, we'll come to you and we'll trust you. That's the first petition to consider this morning. Give us this day our daily bread. Now the second, and one I wish to give more emphasis to, because I think Jesus gives more emphasis to it. Let's consider, secondly, the forgiveness of our sins. The forgiveness of our sins. Look with me at verse 12. We are to pray and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then look at the addendum in verse 14. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, this text immediately makes some people anxious, and one or two of you communicated that anxiety to me last week in anticipation of this sermon. Let's start with what the text does not mean, okay? Some wonder, is this text teaching that our forgiveness of others is meant to be a prior condition to us receiving forgiveness from God? It's important you get this. The answer is emphatically no. Jesus is not setting up our forgiveness of others as a prior condition that needs to be met 
before He would consider saving us, forgiving us. We are justified by faith alone. We are counted righteous through Jesus Christ and what He has done, not any works that we have done. It's not like you need to accumulate a record of forgiving other people before you can qualify for Jesus to forgive you. And there's two reasons I answer in the negative to that question why I say this is so. First of all, it would contradict the overwhelming testimony of dozens and dozens and dozens of other texts. It would also contradict the heart of the gospel itself to say that our forgiveness of others, which is a fruit of the Spirit, is actually a precondition to being saved. Moreover, there is nothing about the language of this text that demands that interpretation. There's just nothing in the text itself that would demand that interpretation that my forgiveness is a prior condition to me being forgiven in the first place. Uh, if, if I prayed to God, I actually, actually read a prayer that Charles Spurgeon had prayed at one point in his life. He was suffering badly with gout, and, um, and he was in miserable pain and terrible agony. And he prayed to God, he, he was recounting this, uh, Lord, if one of my children was writhing in agony as, as you see me writhing here, there's nothing I wouldn't do to help them and to seek to bring relief to them. Oh, and, and Lord, as I would do that for my own children, would you do that for me? Now, is Spurgeon setting up his compassion toward his children as a precondition to God having compassion on him? No, it functions more as an illustration, doesn't it? Just as we are this way toward our children, would you act in this way toward us? And I think that might be how the language is operating here. So please, no one here should conclude that our forgiveness of others is a necessary prior condition to us being forgiven of our sins. You cannot prove that point from this text. Nor does this text mean that God's forgiveness once given can be withdrawn. Again, that would deny the rest of the Scriptures, and it is an interpretation that is not demanded by the language of this passage. You cannot prove that point from this passage. Now, let me just say, just a, a quick time out, okay, from the sermon here, just a little 101 kind of rule to carry with you in your Christian life, a general rule of interpretation. Uh, don't make Jesus say super weird stuff that you know isn't true. Okay, you're not going to hear a seminary professor say that in a class, but people will sometimes come to me and they'll say, you know, we read this, that, and the other, and, and does that mean Jesus thinks this? And I say no, and they say why? And I want to say, because it's, it's weird. Like, Jesus would never say that. That contradicts everything we know about Jesus if that sort of harebrained interpretation is what you're applying to this passage. Not a per it's a rule of thumb, okay? Jesus does say some extreme things. But in general, don't make Jesus say super weird stuff based on harebrained interpretations of passages. Okay, back to the text. I think if we're to understand this text properly, it should be said that this text is not really about the mechanics of when and how God grants forgiveness. Say that again. It's not about the mechanics of when and how God grants forgiveness, but rather about the effect God's forgiveness of us is meant to have on our attitude toward those who sin against us. Or we could put it another way. This text is about what our attitude toward those who sin against us reveals about our experience and expectation of God's forgiveness of us. The text is speaking against an attitude that presumes upon God's forgiveness while all the while shutting up one's heart from forgiving others. So, so logical or chronological precision in terms of the mechanics of God's forgiveness is not Jesus' point. The issue is whether the forgiveness sought from God for our sins and offenses is mirrored in our disposition toward those who sin against us. If the forgiveness of our sins is not matched by an appropriately forgiving attitude toward those who sin against us, God's forgiveness may not be presumed upon. So positively then, what then is Jesus saying? We can say there's two points I would give you. Number one, what this petition reveals, along with the addendum in verses 14 through 15, what this petition reveals is that there is an inherently reciprocal relationship 
between our experience of forgiveness from God and our readiness to forgive others. I'll say that again. There is an inherently reciprocal relationship between our experience of forgiveness from God and our readiness to forgive others. The New Testament will make this clear in so many other places. The grace of God and the mercy of God shown towards sinners is meant to transform them. The forgiveness that we experience is meant to have an effect at the deepest heart level. We become something new. Those who were sinners and rebels against God, those who by their sins crucified the Son of God, when forgiven, when cleansed, when regenerated, when shown mercy and grace and kindness from the Lord, they themselves become gracious in their orientation toward others. They become merciful. They become dispensers of mercy. God's forgiveness of them and their sin uh, shapes them in a new way where they become eager to forgive others their sins. As they have received mercy, they are eager to show mercy. And so we have very positive statements made in other texts in the Bible. Ephesians 4, 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. In other words, your experience of forgiveness yourself is meant to shape your attitude toward others and the forgiveness you're ready to grant toward those who sin against you. Colossians 3.13, we're to bear with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Uh, So I'm to have an awareness of my own sinfulness, my own vileness, my own nakedness, my own brokenness, my many offenses against God, and I'm to be so overwhelmed and blessed and changed and influenced by the superabundance of His grace and His mercy and His forgiveness toward me that it begins to become intuitive even to the child of God to express forgiveness and mercy and grace to others. There is a kind of freedom we're meant to enter into as the children of God, a freedom to forgive not to hold the sins and offenses of others against them, but rather to mirror the very grace we ourselves have been shown. We are to return that grace and that mercy and that forgiveness toward others. But now a second point. Listen carefully to this. This is not a contradiction of anything I've said so far. second point we're to get from this petition. If you don't forgive others fully and freely you will not be forgiven. That's a true statement. It's stated plainly three times in this passage. If you do not forgive others fully and freely, you will not be forgiven. I mean, you look at the passage. Is there any way around that transparent interpretation? I think Jesus intends to bring this to us in a sobering and even a forceful way. That's why he gives the explanatory comment. Of all these petitions in the Lord's Prayer, this is the only one he singles out for a comment. It's like he's throwing an elbow in the prayer or trying to disciple and teach even as he's showing us how to pray. Perhaps he has in mind the hypocrites and how they would think about forgiveness. So he gives this explanatory comment. You might have noticed what I said. When you ask God to forgive you, it's as you forgive your debtors. If you forgive others their trespasses, your Father will forgive you. If you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. I think Jesus has in view hypocrites who presume upon God's forgiveness while all the while they have their debtors up against the wall by the throat. Some of you know right where I'm going to go now. Matthew 18, 23 through 35, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Do you remember that parable that Jesus tells? Here is this man. He's in tremendous debt up to his eyeballs. He's overwhelmed. He's going to go to prison. And the master, who in this parable is to be the Lord, forgives him of all the debt. That same man leaves rejoicing coming out of the master's presence, and he finds a lesser servant, a lower servant, who owes him a certain amount of money. And what does the man do? He grabs him by the throat, puts him up against the wall, and he demands, you pay back what you owe. 
You pay your debt. And then he throws him in prison until the final debt would be paid. And then Jesus takes it to a very sobering place. The master then hears of this and he calls the man back. And he says, I paid off all that debt. And here you've treated your servant so. And what he does is he then throws the man into prison until the final debt is paid. And he issues a similar warning, a similar exhortation to the one that he gives us here in verses 14 through 15. What is Jesus saying? No such person can comprehend or experience forgiveness if they treat others in that kind of a way. There can be no comprehension or experience of forgiveness for the one who would treat others in that way. Forgiven people forgive people. Those who have received grace become gracious themselves. Those who have experienced God's mercy, they delight to dispense mercy fully and freely. Blessed are the merciful for what? They will be shown mercy. Friends, simply put, I think the implication of our passage this morning is that if you don't forgive people, you're not saved. If you don't forgive people their trespasses against you, you're not saved. To ask God for forgiveness while refusing to grant forgiveness yourself is the height of hypocrisy. It is an affront to God. It's like asking God to bless your marriage while you're in bed with someone else. Or asking God to provide for your family while you're gambling away your life savings in a casino. It dishonors God. It insults God. It is an affront to God. It is rank hypocrisy to expect God's mercy when you yourself hate mercy and shut your heart up to mercy. So friends, as a point of application, let me say this again, as I've said many times from this pulpit. You must understand this. Unforgiveness is simply a non-option for the Christian. Just a non-option. Here's a situation, tension, sin done against you, and there's two or three or four doors you can walk through. The door labeled unforgiveness, not a door you can walk through as a Christian. You refuse forgiveness, and you will not go to heaven. Jesus could not be more clear and direct on this point. This means we must be ready to forgive people, even those who commit terrible wrongs against us. We must forgive our enemies. We must forgive our persecutors. We must forgive our oppressors and abusers. We must be like the Lord who from the cross prayed for the forgiveness of the very ones who put him there. No forgiveness, no heaven. I think I've only said this once in my life, but I remember it very distinctly. Uh, I was meeting with a woman, uh, talking about a difficult situation in her life. It involved her husband, ways he had been sinning against her. And we met many times, and she would repeat this phrase, well, I haven't decided yet if I'm going to forgive him. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to forgive him. She said it like a half dozen times, and I didn't immediately take her to this text, but more interrogated that idea. What do you mean you say you're deciding not to forgive him? But it sort of persisted despite me trying to direct her in other directions, and there came a point where I just felt moved to say to her, sister, if you do not forgive your husband, you will go to hell. And I took her to this passage. Is, is, is what he has done to you worse than what you have done to the Son of God? What you have done to your Maker and your Creator? How could one so awash in mercy and in kindness and compassion and forgiveness from God's hand hold those debtors against us by the throat? It's not an option that we can entertain. We must forgive. We must forgive. As Polly Shepherd said, I had to forgive. It wasn't an option. The Lord has said, if you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. You play with unforgiveness, you are playing with fire. So, brother, sister, I plead with you. I don't know everybody's story here. I imagine that many of us have had terrible things done against us. I plead with you. Forgive the offender. 
Extend mercy. Extend grace. As you have been shown mercy, as you have been forgiven. I'm not talking about restoration of relationship. I'm not saying sin has no consequences. I'm not saying any of that stuff. But I am saying as those who have received such grace and mercy from Christ, should we not be free? to mirror that same grace and mercy to those who offend us and hurt us and harm us in such terrible ways. And I'll go even further. We must learn to forgive people in our hearts even before they ask us. There are people who say, you cannot extend forgiveness until someone repents. Oh, that is so wrong. So wrong. The repentance of the offender is not a condition for our granting forgiveness. can't be restored, really, until there's reconciliation, but you can forgive even when repentance is not expressed. In a parallel passage in Mark 11, Jesus says this, and whenever you stand praying, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Uh, Those who put Jesus on the cross were not asking for forgiveness. But what does Jesus say? Forgive them, Father. Forgive them even before they know to ask for it. Forgive them. We should have the same posture. If we are in God's presence, inviting His mercy and grace and forgiveness in our lives, we should release the offenders, the sinners against us. And we should follow my heart, I forgive. I forgive. And as I forgive them, I ask that you would forgive me. So we see we may not invite God's forgiveness of our sins if we ourselves do not forgive others. That is the lesson for us here. But having said all of that, don't miss the main petition here. What is the main petition, the main thing we are asking God to do in this petition in the Lord's Prayer? It is that He would forgive us our sins, which means, brother, sister, you are meant in your private prayer life, to go to God, I think daily. We're praying for our daily bread. We're going to Him daily. You're meant to go to God, and you're meant to freshly ask His forgiveness. For the manifold sins we commit day by day, we should be going to God asking again, please, Lord, through the gospel, wash me again. Forgive my sins. The sins I've committed this day, we might enumerate particular sins. We might give categories of sins, but we are meant to go to God and invite His forgiveness of our sins even day by day. Sadly, some Christians have the mistaken notion that like repentance is something you did back there, and you wrote it down in your card or in your diary once, and you did it. Go through life, and there's no need to do that again. No, I don't think we could read the New Testament intelligently or honestly and conclude anything other than that we are going to continue to sin as Christians, and we need always to be forgiven. Daily to be forgiven. We read in 1 John 1 verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we who are the children of God, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a motive to go into God's presence with no fiction about yourself, no pretense. Say, Lord, you know my sins are before you. Your eye sees all. I can't fake. I can't put on airs. I'm a sinner. You know what I've done. You know the ways I've failed you. Even as Brad led us in prayer this morning, all the ways we failed the Lord. And would you again extend your forgiveness? I confess my sins again to you. Lord, as I I am eager to forgive those in my life who sin against me, would you forgive me of the sins that I have committed against you? As the Lord's disciples, we will still sin. We are still in need of regular, ongoing forgiveness for the sins we commit day by day, and we are meant to regularly ask our Father for the forgiveness of our sins. And friends, we should expect, we should expect that He will forgive us, because His promise is that He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The third and final petition that we'll consider this morning, we've seen that the Lord's Prayer encompasses our daily needs the forgiveness of our sins. Thirdly and finally, the prayer encompasses our deliverance from temptation and evil. We pray, or are to pray, verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I do believe this constitutes one position, or one petition, excuse me, and not two. And both statements are communicating essentially the same thing, one in the negative form and one in the positive form. And I do think, by the way, we should interpret that last statement, the deliver us from evil, as the evil one, uh, as the tempter, as Satan, as the devil, that we would be delivered from him. Now, you know this, but it must be emphasized whenever you're in this text, as a matter of clarification, that God never tempts anybody. The Bible explicitly says that in numerous places. God never tempts anybody. We may think in terms of Him testing us, that's not really the same thing. But the kind of temptation to try to ensnare us into sin, God doesn't do that. He doesn't tempt His children. And nothing about the language here suggests that God is the one doing the tempting. But there are a couple things we need to understand about this petition, two realities in particular that it reveals. First of all, that we have an adversary who wants to destroy us, and we are vulnerable to his attacks. Don't miss the second part. We, the children of God, have an adversary who wants to destroy us, and we are vulnerable to his attacks. Do you ever feel a little quaint and kind of silly uh, to think of the devil as trying to tempt you? Do you feel somewhat ridiculous thinking about Satan, talking about him, praying about him? I mean, really, in these enlightened times, are we really to imagine there is a devil who is tempting us and trying to get us to sin? The notion of a real devil, a real Satan, has been so satirized and trivialized in our society that many Christians have allowed themselves to think very little about him. Many Christians feel silly or ridiculous or fanciful when they imagine that they have an adversary in the form of a personal and intelligent devil who is their enemy and wants to tempt them and wants to destroy them. Well, friends, I assure you, Satan would be very glad for you to feel that way. You've heard the saying, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was to convince the world he didn't exist. C.S. Lewis, I think, in his book, The Screwtape Letters, says a similar thing. The master demon who's instructing the lesser demon in how to tempt uh, 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 the, the patient or the client, he calls him. He says, he says, try to make him feel silly or ridiculous every time he thinks about you. you try to make him feel small and kind of quaint and, you know, personal devil that's tempting me that I have to think about in that kind of way. Just make him feel like childish when that thought comes into his mind. Friends, if our minds are conditioned by the Bible, we will think about Satan all the time. Just notice this, your own Bible reading, how often the evil one, the tempter, Satan, the devil comes up. It's actually most of the books of the New Testament. If our minds are regulated by the Scriptures, we will think about Satan all the time. You as a child of God are to live in the abiding awareness that you have a great adversary who is seeking at all times to ruin you, to hurt you, to undermine your faith, to lead you into apostasy, to destroy you. One error many Christians make is they are thoughtless about the devil. A further error many Christians will make is that though they know and believe there is an evil one, there is a tempter, there is a Satan, they can become quite cavalier in their attitude about him. They think because they're Christians, they need not worry much about Satan at all, that they're not vulnerable because, after all, they're Christians. That's just awful, really bad theology. We are not to be cavalier. Just, Just read the statements of Jesus and the apostles about the wicked one, about Satan. They were not cavalier about Satan. They didn't make jokes about Satan. No, they were very aware of his power. Let's be very clear. The devil is far stronger than you and me. If you ever triumph over Satan, I assure you it will only be through Christ and the strength that God supplies. Friends, the devil is revealed in the Bible as cunning. He's cunning. 
He's in a perverted way wise. He knows you. He watches you. He studies you. We could say he has case notes on you. He knows where your arm is weak. He knows the little indulgences you're giving into even now that if he could have his way would open wide open into apostasy. Even now, Satan is planning his next attack. People who are cavalier about the devil should be chastened by this very petition. You ought to view yourself as vulnerable. You ought to view him as a lion and you as a sheep. He's a hungry lion seeking for the one who he may devour. And what does the petition say we need? Rescue. Deliverance. We need to be saved from the mouth of the lion. We need to be rescued from his attacks. We need God to do something if we're going to withstand him and be delivered from him. He wishes to sift us as wheat, and he's able to. He wishes to tear us to shreds, and he's able to. And if he doesn't, it will only be because the Lord himself will intercede and do for you the very thing we ask him to do in this prayer. So we should see we have an adversary and we are vulnerable to him. But secondly, we should see by this petition that we need God's help to resist temptation and evil. And he is able and ready to help us. We need God's help to resist temptation and evil. That's what this petition acknowledges. And we know he is able and ready to help us. This petition is a prayer for God to do something. We are to ask God to guard us from temptation. We are to appeal, do not lead us into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Send rescue. Aid us, help us, deliver us. We're to pray, Lord, rescue us, deliver us from the evil one. Make for me a way of escape. Come and be a savior to me. You probably do not know right now exactly how the devil is planning his next attack against you. You probably cannot see in most situations in your life the angle the devil is taking. I have a very faithful friend. He'll ask me this often. When I'm met with some kind of challenge or trial or difficult relational situation, he has often asked me, Alex, what do you think Satan's angle is in this? If, if he were trying to ruin you, as we know he is, if he were trying to distract you, to undermine your faith, to ruin your witness, to dishonor the Lord by your life, what would he do in this situation? What would be his angle? What would be his strategy? And that question does not lead me to want to be cavalier about the devil. It leads me rather to this prayer. Lord, deliver me. Lead me not into temptation. I don't want to fall. I don't want to fail. I don't want to bring reproach to the name of Christ. Deliver me from the evil one and rescue me. And of course, we know from other scriptures, he is faithful and just to help us. He is ready to help us. He's ready to intercede for us. He's willing to provide grace to help in time of need. He will come to our aid. He will come to our rescue. So we need not live in sort of cowering fear of Satan. But we should go to God, the only one who keeps him from ruining our faith, saying, God, help me. Cause me to stand. Give me armor for the fight. Rescue me from the lion's mouth. Deliver me from the evil one. Lead me not into temptation. Our daily needs, the forgiveness of our sins, our deliverance from temptation and evil. A closing word. I have hoped and I have prayed that God will use these sermons, this one and the last two sermons, in a special way to help and serve our prayer lives as individual Christians, as individual children to a father, and as a corporate church. I hope that in these weeks we've come to understand with greater intelligence and greater faith what it is God wants us to pray to Him. But I just want to remind you a couple of basic things and a couple of basic incentives to prayer. We are to recognize with all these petitions, we are not addressing someone who's far off. We're not addressing someone who's disinterested in our lives. We're coming to our Father in heaven who delights in us as children, 
wants us to come near and wants us to pray prayers as broad and as expansive as His glory and the concerns of His kingdom and even for our daily needs, the forgiveness of the sins we've committed even this morning, deliverance from Satan who even now looks upon us wishing to undermine our faith. We're to go to Him at all times as our Father. What an incentive to pray. If He were revealed as something other, we may still pray to Him, but not nearly with the degree of warmth and confidence and freedom and access. God reveals Himself as our Father. And that should be a grand incentive to run into His presence, to make our petitions known to Him. And remember that phrase, your Father who is in secret. I don't know what about that. I've I've read this text a million times. In the last month or so, that's been so precious to me, to know that if I go in my room and I shut the door, my Father's there. It's where He lives. He's there in secret, and His eye is on me. Your Father who sees in secret. Brothers and sisters, I hope that also provides us with a great motivation to pursue day by day secret times in prayer with our Father and to bring to Him the concerns of His glory and His kingdom and His will, and our daily needs and anxieties, and the forgiveness of our sins, and our deliverance from the evil one. It's such a sad thing how prayerless we can be. If you have not cultivated this habit in your own life, I urge you, do not let a day go by for the rest of your life without seeking your Father in heaven in secret in prayer. By grace, you can do this. I'm just, before I eat, before I talk to my spouse, before I clock in it, where I'm going to God. And I'm praying for these things. I want to be with my Father in secret, and I want Him to see me, and I want to know communion and fellowship with Him. Make this the pattern and the ethos of your Christian life. This is the most basic of Christian activities to seek God in secret, to seek our Father in prayer. May God help us in this. Let's pray together. Father, You have furnished us with so many incentives and motivations to seek You. You're so humble and patient with us, so gracious. You have condescended to the lowly. You've taught us how to pray. And you've given us warm encouragements from your word to seek you, to come to you as a child to a father. Father, for any of us here who struggle to see you as their father, your children here who for some reason, be it sin or their constitution or their psychology or their past, who is struggling to enjoy the freedom and the access and the warmth and the tenderness and the relationship that is meant for we as your children to experience with you, our Father, in your presence. Would you please help them? Would you please, in compelling ways, in ways that register at the level of our experience and our emotions, would you please, in compelling ways, convince us that you are indeed our Father? May your spirit bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and that it is our birthright to cry, Abba, Father. Not presumption. Purchase possession by the gospel. May, Lord, that pervade the way we live and we think we're the children of God and we have access to our Father. We could come to Him even with our sins and failings. We can come to Him with our daily needs and anxieties. There's nothing we can't bring to our Father. Give us that constant awareness, the joy of living in what is truly reality, that we are Your children, that You really do love us, and that You really do want to draw us close and invite us into fellowship and communion, Your heart to ours. Please do this for all of us. 
and may we experience it at the level of our prayer lives. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.